matter how I got you. You're sick of making donuts and you're ready to start creating some cinematic VFX shots using Blender. Well then, boot up your PC, take a seat, and click on whatever the heck this logo is supposed to be, and let's get started. Alright, so once we have our footage recorded, the first step of the VFX process is always motion tracking. This basically involves creating a digital camera in our scene that has the same motion of our real-life camera. Doing this will allow whatever we add to the 3D scene to move and change perspective as if it was recorded by our real camera instead of just floating around on top of the footage. To do this, Blender tracks and gathers information about how specific points move in our shot and in relation to one another, then does some crazy math magic to spit out our digital camera based on that data. Thus, for the best results, our footage should be smooth and have plenty of distinguishable details so that Blender can easily grab this information. And if you really want to be smart and plan ahead, you could also grab some information like sensor size and camera focal length, then feed that into Blender to improve the digital reconstruction of our real-world camera. Alright, you got all that? No? Well, let's hop into Blender and do it anyways. So the first thing you want to do is switch the editor type to Movie Clip Editor, then click Open to open up your shot. Then you'll want to click Set Scene Frames and Prefetch so that our shot runs smoothly in Blender. Now we can actually start tracking 2D points in our shot so Blender can reconstruct a digital camera. If you go to the tracking tab, you'll actually see that Blender has a few different trackers to choose from, but the one you're going to want to use in most cases is Affine since it will gather location and rotation data, in addition to any changes in perspective and skew. And with that selected, we can now add our trackers. Now, you could just use the Add button to place trackers manually, but personally I like to avoid getting carpal tunnel, so instead just click Detect Features, which causes Blender to automatically place trackers into the scene wherever it finds distinguishable features. Now all you need to do is click Track Forward and BAM! Data! Usually you want about 8 tracks going all the way through your shot, but if some of the tracks don't last that long, you can go to the last frame of your shot, click Detect Features, and Track Backwards instead of Forwards to get more data. Also, it's important to make sure that you have enough trackers in the place where you want to put your object, which in my case is the ground. So if Detect Features isn't giving you enough trackers in that location, this might be a good time to use those beautiful eyes of yours to find details yourself and manually place trackers there. Once you've got around 8 tracks going all the way through your shot, you go down to the camera tab and put in as much info as you can about your camera, such as focal length or sensor size. Or you could just go and select Refined Focal Length to have Blender do that for you automatically. Then you can pop over to the Solve tab and click A to select all your tracks, then click Solve to solve the camera motion. Now, if you did everything right, you should see a number pop up on the right-hand corner of your screen. This is the solve error, which, to spare you from all the math, basically tells you how accurate the 3D camera is to the real-world camera. Now, for the best solve, Blender recommends a number below 0.3, but anything between 1 and 3 can also be usable. If your solve isn't below that already, you can go over to the Cleanup tab to refine your tracking data. First off, you can click Filter Tracks, which will cause Blender to select any trackers which seem to be misbehaving. Once that's done, you could delete those misbehaving tracks and click Resolve to see if you get a better error. You could also, once again, do this manually by scrubbing through the shot, selecting any malicious tracks, and banishing them to the Shadow Realm using the Delete button. Another trick that I like to do is to open another window by clicking clicking and dragging on the corner, and then switching the view to graph. Now I know this looks scary and is probably giving you horrifying flashbacks to middle school algebra class, but this actually allows us to see clearly how we need to clean up our solve. You see, each of these lines represents X and Y data for one of our tracks in the scene. Now all of these lines should roughly follow the same pattern on the graph because they are all graphical representations of the same camera movement meaning that the ones that seem to break this pattern are inaccurate tracks. Thus, this view makes it easy to detect and delete any bad tracks with the added benefit of making you look super smart whenever someone catches a glimpse of your monitor. Anyway, after doing a bit of cleanup, you should hopefully have a good solve error, which means we can move on to part two. Alright, so assuming you made it through the horrible nightmare that is camera tracking, we should have a digital camera that matches the motion of our real camera, right? Well, yes, but actually no, because if we look at our 3D scene, we can see that the camera isn't actually moving. This is because we actually have to apply our solve data to our 3D camera. To do that, all you have to do is go to the Scene Setup tab and click Set as Background and Set up Tracking Scene. This accomplishes a few things. It applies our camera solve to the camera in the 3D scene. It creates a ground plane for our 3D world that will catch the shadows of whatever object we place on top of it, and it sets our footage as a semi-transparent background plate within the camera view itself. You can see this in effect if you click zero on the numpad to access the camera view and also make sure that you are switched to cycles and have transparency checked under your render settings. Also to see your shadow capture in action you're going to want to go to the outliner and move the ground plane that's in the background collection to the foreground collection. And there you go! 
But not relax just yet because if we scrub through the timeline you can see that our floor plane and cube aren't really moving with the footage. You see Blender's kind of stupid and doesn't actually know where the floor plane is supposed to be in our scene, where the center of our scene should be, or even how big things are supposed to be in our scene. To fix this you're going to need to go back to the movie clip editor and select a track that you want to be the center of your scene, then go over to the orientation tab and click set origin so that the origin of our 3D scene will match up with that selected track. Then you're going to want to select three tracks that are on the floor of your scene and click floor in the orientation tab, which should then orient the ground plane in our 3D scene to match that of our footage. Lastly, to set your scene scale, you're going to want to find two tracks that you kind of know the distance between. For example, I think that these two tracks are about one meter apart. Then you're going to want to input whatever that distance is into the distance parameter and click set scale. And look at that, now your scene should be lined up and ready to go. Alright, with that out of the way, now we're ready to move on to the fun stuff and import whatever model we want into our 3D scene. Now, if you want to model something yourself, that's cool, but personally I prefer to just go to productioncrate.com and download one of their high quality assets. But once you got your model, you can now import it by going to File and Import and selecting whatever 3D file type you intend to import. Then just position the model wherever you feel like you want it to be using the Translation and Rotation tool. Now this is pretty sweet and all, but if you switch over to the material view, you may notice that your model either has no material, or just a basic one with an image texture depending on how you imported your model. Thus we're going to have to switch over to the shader editor and adjust the model's materials to get a more realistic result. Luckily, Production Crate's assets make it really easy for us. All you need to do is create some new image texture nodes for the roughness, normal, and metallic textures. These textures will essentially control how metallic, rough, or bumpy certain parts of the model are. Then simply click on the file icon to import your desired texture into each node and plug each node into the corresponding slot in the principled BSDF shader. Roughness to roughness, metallic to metallic, etc. And if you have a bump or normal map, you're going to need to place an intermediate bump or normal map node in between your texture and the corresponding slot and mess with the strength parameters a bit to get it to work. Also, be sure to switch all of these nodes, except for the image texture node, to non-color data. That way it doesn't screw with our material. Alright, so if we pop over to the render preview, we can see that our model's materials are looking better, but the model doesn't quite feel like it fits on the scene yet. This is because of the next important step, which is lighting. You see, right now the model is just being lit by a grey world color and a pathetic little point light that Blender adds by default. However, assuming you didn't film your shot in a grey walled insane asylum, this lighting probably isn't the same lighting as seen in your clip. To make the lighting match, the best thing we could do is use a 360 HDRI or high dynamic range image. This allows Blender to realistically light our scene from every angle since it's pulling its lighting information from a real image that can occupy a 360 degree space. Also, the fact that it has a high dynamic range means we can manually adjust the strength of the light emitted from the image to fit our scene. Now, the best way to get an HDRI is to use a 360 degree camera to capture it on set so that the lighting matches perfectly. However, if you didn't do that, don't rage quit just yet. The next best thing we could do is go to productioncrate.com and use one of their HDRIs that best matches the lighting found in our scene. For example, since my shot was filmed on a partly cloudy day in mid-afternoon, I could go to productioncrate.com and find an HDRI that best fits my footage. Anyway, once you have your HDRI, you can go to the world settings, and click on color, then click on environment texture. Now, if everything just turned purple, don't worry, you didn't break anything. Yet. That's just Blender's way of telling you that you have no texture imported. So simply go to open image, import the HDRI, and boom, realistic lighting. However, you may notice that your shadows are facing the wrong direction. If that's the case, simply go to the shader editor, switch it from object to world, then click on use nodes, which allows us to use nodes to edit the environment. In this case, we want to add a mapping and texture coordinate node, then connect the object slot of the coordinate node to the vector slot of the mapping node, in the vector slot of the mapping node to the vector slot of the HDRI. Now we can use these sliders here to rotate the HDRI so that the shadows line up. Also feel free to adjust the strength of the HDRI and add additional lights if needed to match the lighting of the scene even better.
All right, the last step of the VFX process is compositing, which means bringing our 3D render and our footage together into a final composition. But before we start compositing, we need to get a quick render of our shot. First off, you're gonna wanna go to the view layer properties and enable shadow catcher pass so that Blender renders out an image with some shadow catcher information. Then we can go to the render tab and check a few things before we start rendering. For example, if your shot has motion blur, you're gonna wanna check that in the render settings to make sure that the blur of the 3D element in the background shot map. Then we can go over to the render drop down and edit the samples to fit our liking. More samples equals a crisper shot, but it will also take a lot longer. For a shot like mine with a simple 3D object and transparent background, around 250 samples works just fine. Furthermore, Blender has a denoiser that's enabled automatically, so if you really don't want to wait that long for your render to be done, or you just have a crusty workstation, you can just lower the sample count and let Blender's denoiser do the rest of the work. Also, before we get a render out, make sure you go to the top right corner and delete the background layer that Blender will try to render out by default since in this case we're not going to need it. With that set, we can click render image and listen to the beautiful sound of our computer's fans breaking the sound bear. And done. Now you can see Blender has already done a little bit of compositing for us by default, however, it did a crappy job, especially considering we don't have a shadow. So let's clean it up a bit by going to the compositing tab and clicking use nodes, then clicking fit in the background tab so we can see the full composite. If we look at the node set up here, we can see that Blender, by default, has used a series of alpha over nodes to overlay the 3D render on top of the background plate. This node works by taking what's ever in the bottom image slot, in this case our render, and overlaying it on top of whatever is in the top image slot, which in this case is our footage. Blender by default has created two of these, but we're not going to need both of them, so we can just delete one of them, and also another one of these render layer nodes, and then replug the alpha over node into the composite and viewer nodes. Now, with things simplified a bit, we can add that shadow. First off, I'm going to plug the shadow catcher pass of the rendered layer node into the viewer node so I can actually see what I'm doing. Essentially, we want to tell Blender to make everything that's white transparent, everything that's black opaque, and everything that's in between semi-transparent. To do this, add an alpha over node with the shadow catcher plug into the factor. Then we can turn the background color to black and we are left with exactly what we started with. Great. However, what this allows us to do is select the black shadow and bring up its alpha transparency. Although it might not look like it, Blender is now treating everything that is fully black to be transparent and everything that's fully white to be opaque. However, we want the opposite of that, so all we need to do is take up Blender's in reverse card, also known as the invert node, and plug it in after the alpha over node and select alpha so that we get our transparency. Sweet, now we have our semi-transparent shadow isolated, but it's also white. This is because, in addition to transparency, the invert node has also flipped the colors. So simply change the shadow color to white and now we get something that's usable. To deposit this shadow into our footage, you're going to want to grab yet another alpha over node, plug the shadow into the foreground slot, and in the background slot we can put the combined render and background footage and then plug all of that into the composite and viewer node. Now with all of that set up, we can pretty much do whatever we want in our composite to match our 3D render to our footage since this node setup gives us the ability to individually manipulate our shadow, model, and footage. What I ended up doing is using a brightness and contrast node to bring down the contrast of the model a bit and to raise up the brightness of the shadow. Then I used some blur nodes to blur both the model and the render. Then, lastly, I used some color balance and color correction nodes to add an overall orange and teal grade to the final composition. And now with all that done, just go over to the output tab, select where you want your render to be output and its file type, click on that glorious render animation button, wait a couple of millennia, and enjoy your finished shot.